proudly we hail. From New York City, where the American stage begins, here is another program with a cast of outstanding players. Public service time has been made available by this station for your Army and your Air Force to bring you this story as proudly we hail freedom. concerns Thomas Paine, a true story of one of America's greatest exponents of freedom. Our first act curtain will rise in just a moment, but first... Today, your rapidly expanding United States Army needs intelligent young men with ability and ambition. Men intelligent enough to recognize the vital need for a strong armed force. Men with ability enough to be trained in a necessary job. Men with ambition enough to secure the future for themselves and their loved ones. Does this description fit you? Can you qualify? For full information on how you can fit in with the finest, check with your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station now. And now your Army and your Air Force present the proudly we hail production, Thomas Paine. This is the story about a man named Payne, Tom Payne. It's a story about our country, too, about its birth. It's page one in the book of our heritage, a page no American will ever forget. Tom Payne's name isn't remembered as well as many of the names on that page, but what he did and believed had a lot to do with its writing. The fact is, some people feel without him, that page might not have been written at all. This is our story. The month was November, the year 1774, when Tom Paine first set foot on the soil of America. He came from England, arriving in Philadelphia, a sick and nearly penniless man. With him, he had a letter of introduction from Ben Franklin. Aside from that, he had little else but the clothes on his back. Now he stepped into a land that was trembling with revolt, fed up with domination and tyranny. Tom Paine looked at what he saw, listened to what he heard, placed his fingers on the pulse of a rumbling America, and knew its beat. He was an uncommon man who could talk to common men, could listen to their words with understanding. In Tom Paine burned the hope of America. I speak plain. And I'm afeard of no man on land or sea. I say it is time we were rid of the lobster back. Time we sailed our own ship and done with a hellsman who don't know port from starboard. The captain speaks true. And I say the captain's a spouting fool. Be lay there, my dandy, before I scuttle you. Just where would you ungrateful dogs be were it not for the grace and kindness of his majesty? Why, I'd say we'd be right where we are now and far happier about it. I know you not, sir, and I like not your words nor your ugly face. My face is God's work. My words are my own, and I speak them as I please. And as for knowing me, there would be no benefit in it for you. <laughs> That's the kind of talk I like. A drink for the stranger. You'll not find such talk so enlightening in a king's jail or dangling from a gibbet. The king has many jails and many gibbets. Aye, and one day you murderous dogs will grace them. A vast tell you before I break your jaw. Take your fine talk elsewhere. I'll hear no more of it. Go tell the king his royal subjects are tired of his ways. You've not heard the last of this. Only the beginning, my friend. Only the beginning. I know you not, sir, but shake your hand, I will. I'm Captain Josiah Clark of the Sea Witch out of Boston. How do you do, Captain? I'm Thomas Paine, late of England. Come in, come in. Good day, Mr. Aitken. 
I'm Payne. Tom Payne. Ah, hey, so I gathered. Sit down, sir. I, uh, read the letter you brought from Mr. Franklin. You found him where, I trust? I, I found him, sir. Good. And now what service can I be to you? I suppose you want to borrow money? No, Mr. Aitken, I wish to borrow nothing. I, uh... Well, I heard that you were starting a magazine. I should like to write for it. Hmm, you don't tell me. And just what has been your profession? Well, I'm a staymaker by trade. I've also been a tinker, sailor, tax collector, carpenter, teacher, writer of sorts, and a general failure. <laughs> nor do you lack frankness. No, nor do I lack frankness. <laughs> well, it's true. I am going to publish a magazine. The Pennsylvania magazine, to be exact. Is uh, that some of your writing you brought with you? Yes, it is, sir. Uh, leave it with me and come in tomorrow, Mr. Payne. We shall discuss this further. Thank you, sir. And good day. Good day, Mr. Payne. No, Tom Payne didn't lack frankness nor ability. He became the first editor of Robert Aitken's Pennsylvania Magazine and in a very short time made it the most widely read publication, not just in Pennsylvania, but in all the colonies. Then, five short months after his arrival, the seething volcano of growing discontent toward the mother country erupted. The date, April 19, 1775. It was five days later that a rider from the north galloped into Philadelphia. He pulled up before the city tavern and began shouting the news. It started! It started! It's war! War! What are you spouting about, man? A war, I said. They fought at Concord and then at Lexington and drove the bloody lobster backs plumb back into Boston. Yeah, get the man a drink and maybe he'll make some sense. Lexington? Concord? Where's that? In Massachusetts, you blame digits. Who drove the lobster backs into Boston? Who? The farmers, that's who. They licked him fair. It's war, brother, war! <laughs> So, gentlemen, at last it's come. I knew it must, soon or late. But, Tom, what concerns Massachusetts does not concern Pennsylvania. What concerns Massachusetts, Mr. Aiken, not only concerns us, it concerns the whole world. Oh, come, Payne. Of course we want our differences with England straightened out, but bloodshed, this wild talk of independence, is serious. It can't be rushed into. It must be considered. And you, Mr. Johnson, are a fool to talk to. It was more than a spark setting off a bonfire that happened at Lexington and Concord. That spark must not be allowed to die. It must become an inferno. Lexington was not just an act of man. I believe it an act of God. And it is a sacred duty of all of us to join this struggle. Consider it, you say. I say there is nothing left to consider. Let us act upon it now. Union and independence at this time are out of the question. Perhaps for you, gentlemen. But as for me, you will please accept my resignation. I have more important work to do. <laughs> So Tom Paine left the Pennsylvania magazine and with a few shillings in his pocket set out on his important work to write the case of America against tyranny. It was his practice during those first unsettled and confused months to stroll out from the city along the country roads. In this scene of peace and quiet, he'd go over in his mind just what this armed uprising was all about, what caused it, what could be gained by it. It was on such a stroll that he first met Sarah Rumpel. What right has any man... Oh, no, no, no. But, uh... But if the cause be... <laughs> oh, I... I beg your pardon. Oh, aren't you the one having a terrible argument all by yourself, weren't you? <laughs> oh, yes, madam, I suppose I was. I had thought I was alone out here. Oh, no, I, I saw you from the house. I've seen you walking by before. And it's such a hot scorcher of a day... I thought you might like a glass of buttermilk. Well, you're very kind, miss. Uh, it is a hot day, and I certainly would like a cool glass of buttermilk. Uh, my name is Sarah Wumpel. That's my past farm right there. Oh. My name is Thomas Payne. Payne? You're the one who writes all those things in that magazine. Well, of... Oh, Pa will certainly want to meet you. Pa! Pa, Tom Payne's come to pay us a call. Well, Mr. Aiken. Tom, 
We've been friends since that first day you walked in here. Now I've read this, this common sense of yours, and I cannot, I shall not take the responsibility of printing it. But, Mr. You Aiken, you... speak treason and expect me to be a part of it. No, Tom, I'm sorry. I am not the man for you. Well, Mr. Rush, a very rebellious piece of writing, Mr. Payne, and one I shall not jeopardize myself in printing. I uh, cannot help but admit I admire what you have done, but... Won't take the chance. Treasonous. Uh, can't afford the risk. No. No. Why don't you try the Scot, Robert Bell? Robert Bell? Robert Bell. Mr. Payne, uh, I've read your wee book. It is a brave piece of scribbling. How much of a royalty would you be expecting if I were to undertake the job? I want no money. I did not write it for money, Mr. Bell. Print my book. Print it, and I shall have reward enough. Aye, Mr. Payne, that I will. That I will. In January of 1776, without fanfare or introduction, there appeared the booklet entitled Common Sense, written by an Englishman. It shot like a ray of sunlight through a dark overcast. It was printed and reprinted throughout the 13 colonies. 300,000 copies. One-third of the entire population owned it, and no one can say how many more read it. And just what did Tom Paine say? What did he say to inspire men toward the distant goal of independence? The sun never shone on a cause of greater worth. It is not the affair of a city, a county, a province, or a kingdom, but of a continent of at least one-eighth part of the habitable globe. O oh, ye that love mankind, ye that dare oppose not only tyranny, but the tyrant, stand forth. Every spot of the old world is overrun with oppression. Freedom hath been hunted around the globe. Asia and Africa have long expelled her. Europe regards her like a stranger, and England hath given her warning to depart. Oh, receive the fugitive, and prepare in time an asylum for mankind. Overnight, the name of Tom Paine and his book swept through the slowly awakening colonies. Tom Paine had struck the heart of the people. He had given them the will, the reasons, and the ultimate result of their bid for freedom. He wrote in words they all understood... He could have accepted a position in the government, but instead he chose to fight for what he believed. But before he left, he went to say goodbye to Sarah. Good day, Tom. Good day, Sarah. You've come to say goodbye. Yes. Yes, that's right. You're going away to the fighting. Yes, I must. I knew you would. Sarah, maybe someday I'll come back. Maybe you will, Tom. You'll always be welcome here and in my heart. Will you kiss me goodbye? You are listening to the proudly we hail production of Thomas Paine. We'll return to our story in just a moment. Young man, let's talk about your future and America's future. They're important to each other, you know. Today, your United States Army is charged with a vital responsibility. You need only to glance at your local newspaper to realize how vital. And to meet this responsibility, the Army is rapidly expanding its forces. They have a job for you, a job that must be done by men of courage. You can get full details of how you may best serve your future and your country's future by a visit to your nearest United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station today. You are listening to Proudly We Hail, and now we present the second act of Thomas Paine. Tom Paine found the army, what was left of it, at Fort Lee, across from the island of Manhattan. There it lay, licking its wounds after being cut to pieces and thrown off of Long Island, battered at Harlem, and again at Westchester, losing Fort Washington. From 20,000 men, it had shrunk to 12,000, and the number growing less daily as many deserted the cause they had so bravely taken up. Mr. Payne? 
General Washington will see you now. Go right in. Thank you. Well, Mr. Payne, we meet again. And a pleasure, sir, I assure you. You do not come upon us at a happy hour. How can I serve you? It is I who have come to ask that question of you. You have come to join us, then? Good. I thought you would. I have need of your common sense and badly. The men are angry, bitter, discouraged. They've known nothing but defeat. We are new to this kind of life, and we're learning painfully. What kind of position would you choose in my army? General Washington, I am not a soldier, and therefore I want no position of rank. Let me go among the men and talk to them. Let me be one of them. Let me be Tom Paine, volunteer. No more. I don't know whether your words will be listened to here, but you have my permission to try. You have not picked an easy task. I, for one, welcome you in any capacity. And so Tom Paine went amongst the men. And as Washington had said, they were in no mood to hear words. Did you expect to win your freedom easily in a few battles? Did you expect to buy it cheap? I've had a belly full of your mouth, Payne. Common sense or no? Now you can have a belly full of my fist. If you want my fists as well as my words, you're welcome to them. I say any man who deserts his cause now is no man at all, but a gutless, craven coward. And where were you, Tom Payne, at Long Island? I was not there, but I'm here now. And I'll be here as long as there's breath in me. Well, I'll save mine and go home. Then go, and may your soul shrivel inside your worthless carcass. No man can speak to me like that. I'll call you every foul name I can think of, and all of them too good for you. Get up out of the mud, Mr. Payne, and I'll knock you down again. I know fear, and when you're through, go home. Go home to your wife. <laughs> wait, wait. Wait, I've done, will you? I cannot fight with you. I can knock the sense out of you. But you'd be only knocking common sense into me. Enough, I say. Let him speak his peace. Fort Lee captured. The long retreat begins, and despite Tom's words, desertion and more desertion. Down through hostile New Jersey they march, the English snarling at their heels. Retreat. 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 Close up! there, I say! Hey, you there! Get back in the ranks. No need to shout. This man is ill. Here, give us a hand. Easy, Jacob. Easy. Put his arm around your neck. Oh. Retreat. Retreat. Why must we always retreat? Let me lie down. Easy. <coughs> Let me lie down. Sam, right. Sam. Hi, Tom. See if there can be found a room in one of the wagons for Jacob. Hi. He's done in. I shall go no further. I'll make an end of retreating here now. Now, hey, let Jacob, go of me. Easy, uh, easy, Jake. Molly. <coughs> I'm afraid he's about done. If only there were a dry place for him. Tom. Tom. I, I, Jacob. I didn't leave you, Tom. I stayed. I know, Jacob. But I... I gotta leave you now. Nonsense, Jake. When the sun comes out, you'll be fine again. Ah, the sun. The warm sun. What I wouldn't give for a look at it. You know, Tom, the sun is like liberty, bright and like gold. Now, nothing but rain, cold, cold. The sun went out. No, Jacob, no. It's hiding behind a cloud, that's all. I, I must lie down. <laughs> He's fainted. Yeah, let me put him down. Tom, Tom Payne, look, look there, I see the sun, there, yonder. He 
He's gone. Aye, he's gone. Jacob Haskell was gone, and many others with him, many not so bravely, walking off in the night alone or in groups. And those that remained continued to retreat slowly, painfully, winter upon them. It wasn't difficult for the English to follow with bloody footprints marking their way. Tom, I sent for you because I need you as I never have. Our plight is desperate. We number little more than 2,000 men. I fear we shall have to retreat west into the mountains unless something is done soon. We need food, we need ammunition, we need men. The colonies must be made fully aware of our circumstances. You must write another common sense. Write and tell them, Tom. Congress must know, the people must know. Do what you can. Evening, Thad. Well, evening, Tom. You sit here and you won't be freezing your bones so fast. What did the general want, Tom? Later, Sam. Thad, can I use your drum? I that you can, Tom. <laughs> you gonna play us a jig? I'm going to write you one. God willing. <laughs> hey, Tom Payne's gonna write us a jig. <laughs> Give us some common sense, Tom boy. There in the flickering firelight with a cold winter wind whipping about him, a drum between his knees with its head for a table, he wrote them a jig that was a symphony. He wrote them immortal words that shall live in time as a beacon light for all freedom-loving people. These are the times that try men's souls. The sunshine soldier and the summer patriot will in this crisis shrink from the service of his country. But he that stands it now deserves the love and thanks of man and woman. Tyranny, like hell, is not easily conquered. Yet we have the consolation. Tom left the Army shortly after the first of the year to take the job of Secretary of the Congressional Committee of Foreign Affairs. He continued to write more crisis papers. What he wrote not only inspired, it made sense to even the simplest mind. He stayed on at this job until the Battle of Brandywine Creek in September 1777. It was a disastrous battle for the American cause. Philadelphia now lay open to the English. The city was gripped with fear. And Payne? Payne wrote another crisis paper and stayed on, exhorting, pleading with those who left. The strongest fort an army can have is a city. Every street can be a death trap for the enemy. We can hold this city, and we must. Banish the fear from your hearts, I say. It is not too late. Stand here with me now. Only a few listened. Not enough. Tories tried to assassinate him, and finally, at the last minute, with the Hessians entering the city, he went to seek out the army. He was with the army at Germantown. Tom was with him at Fort Mifflin, too. Fort Mercer... He was there through the hard autumn of defeat, doing what he could. While Lord Howe enjoyed the comforts of Philadelphia, the men at Valley Forge knew no comfort, only bitter cold, suffering, and death. Tom, you can do no good here. Only one more to feed, only another man suffering, and God knows there are already too many. Go find the Congress, Tom. Go find them wherever they are. Tell them I must have help if I'm to go on. It's the same story. If anything, worse now than the winter before. I sometimes wonder how we've endured so long. He found the Congress at York, and they welcomed him. He stayed on with them, laboring through the winter day and night, writing more crisis papers, wrangling shipments of food for the army, tireless and unceasing in his efforts. Another spring. And the 4,000 survivors of the long winter at Valley Forge were joined by 8,000 new recruits. Again, the armies took the field. At Monmouth, in the colony of New Jersey, they met. All right! Spread out along that fence! Check your priming! At Monmouth, the cause of America, freedom, was the cause of all mankind. Stand easy! This time we don't run! 
It stood and it held. And for the first time in nearly three years, put to flight its proud enemy. The war didn't end there at Monmouth. It took another five bitter years of fighting to do that. But a lot of folks feel that Monmouth was the turning point. But through it all to the very end... Tom Paine continued to labor with his pen, his mind, his voice. His energy and faith were tireless. And finally, the day for which he had so long labored did come. And he was able to write... The times that tried men's souls are over. And the greatest and completest revolution the world ever knew... gloriously and happily accomplished. That's not the whole story of Tom Paine's life, but it's the part that most directly affects us. Between that time and this, much has happened. But the basic belief for which men fought and died in those days are the same beliefs we uphold today. We owe so much to those gallant men. And it's often been said, if George Washington was the sword of the American Revolution, Tom Paine was the pen. These are the times that try men's souls. The sunshine soldier and the summer patriot will in this crisis shrink from his duty. But he who stands it now deserves the love. Here's a special message for the young men of our country. The United States Army, the senior service of our armed forces, is expanding rapidly and needs your help. By enlisting in the United States Army, you'll not only get the finest training in the world, but you'll have the special pride that goes with wearing a United States Army uniform. Why not get full details today? Visit your local United States Army and United States Air Force recruiting station. Enlist now. This has been another program on Proudly We Hail, presented transcribed in cooperation with this station. Proudly We Hail is produced by the Recruiting Publicity Bureau for the United States Army and United States Air Force Recruiting Service. This is Kenneth Banghart speaking and inviting you to tune in this same station next week for another interesting story on Proudly We Hail. <laughs>